Good morning. Welcome back, day three. Um, there's a lot of people back at work today and uh, saying, are you recording it? And I was like, I am. So now I've got even extra pressure to remember to record. Recording. And if I record to the computer, it records. We have it as gallery view so we can see everyone's faces. Um, and if you record to the computer, that's how it records. But when you do it to the cloud, you can then download it in its speaker view. Um, so one of the videos from day one, I, I got it wrong. But apart from that, it's been good. Um, very well. I have. I've been very good. The timings today are mad. I don't know what I was thinking when I created it, but we were going to be starting at 11. But Dave said, let's have that hour from 10 till 11 to really hear from people. And I've said to him, you know, if we have this time, then he has to make sure he keeps his mouth shut and doesn't answer questions too long. Um, so we really do want to hear from people and see what you've been hearing, insights, questions, frustrations. Like I think you've probably seen people who've been on other retreats that there isn't anything that we're that you can't ask or say and you don't have to pretend to be feeling happy and light if that's not what's going on for you. Um, I know that on the second retreat, Paul was having a really hard time and when he shared it, it was really helpful for people. Um, so it, it really is anything goes. So if you have a question, an observation or reflection or a frustration uh, that you'd like to share with us and see how we all respond to it, um, please do so over the next hour. So Kelly has a hand up and then Leanne has a hand up. Mine's actually quite an irrelevant question, like it's properly irrelevant. I just wanted to know where uh, Sharon lives. <laughs> Because it looked so beautiful. Shimling. <laughs> well, right now. Um, so I live on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of Martha's Vineyard. I mean, an island off Massachusetts. Sorry, it's 5 a.m. Um, but this is all you'd see now. <laughs> I can't actually see you right now. Exactly, because it's pitch black. It's 5 a.m. <laughs> I just wanted to know, so I was just being nosy, it just looks so beautiful. I was like, oh, I think I might have found the place I'd like to live. <laughs> oh, come. No, it's nice to know each other and where we are. I love that. Thank oh, you for so asking. Cool. Anyway, that was it. It was just a friendly inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We like friendliness. Cool. Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. So beautiful. It anyway, is. I'll shut up now. Leanne, Leanne how are you, love? You're muted. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing so well. Um, yesterday, when I was listening to you guys talking and in the break just before um, Bill was coming on, I went into the kitchen to get something and I found Jesse exercising. Um, So to be totally honest, I have no idea where I am. Uh, I don't know. I'm in and out and up and down. And and I was really, really angry with her um, just because I've given her every opportunity to be honest with me. And she wasn't. And that really hurt because I trusted in her. Um, but during the, like it started off, like I was screaming so much, my throat was hurting. And after we just sat down and we spoke for a little while, I felt myself um, like falling into a place of, of, of kind of love and being able to talk to her from a, a calmer place. And she she said to me, Mommy, why are you being nice to me? Um, I've done something terrible. And I was like, that's just what's coming out for me right now. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't that's just what's happened. Um 
and I was all right last night, but I've woken up today and I'm feeling very heavy and down and sad. game of life eh? I just feel like geez, I've, I've had my shape you know <laughs> when does the peace part come Leon, you are somebody who has experienced peace. Yeah, I have. Mm. You are somebody who has faced some very difficult times. Both in your own personal life and in your, in your family life, your close family life. <clears throat> I've seen you find peace. I think it can be really easy to get caught up in what we're experiencing now, like we discussed yesterday. It's like what we are experiencing right in this very present moment is all there is. And so therefore it appears like that's all there ever has been. But I know that you've seen the magic, found the love, found the peace in spite of all the difficulties in that you were experiencing in your reality, in your external reality or your physical reality, your body. Life's a dynamic thing. It always will be. There will always be things come into our experience that we're not going to like. There's going to be people and circumstances. But I know that you know what this message is. And I know that you've seen beyond the words. You found that magic. It's very easy to forget that magic. It's very easy to take it for granted and get complacent. To see what you've actually seen. Don't forget where peace exists. The other thing I was going to say, Leanne, is like, go easy on yourself. Like we have a, a friend who has struggled with addiction, a really good friend who you, you just love to bits. And since I've met him, I've fallen in love with him. And and he's been in and out of rehab uh, three or so times now. And he's told quite a lot of fibs. And, and there's been times when we felt so frustrated and angry and felt like advantage has been taken and we are human and this is your daughter who you've kind of watched really struggle really wake up and then kind of you feel like they have this beautiful honest relationship and then you find out okay there's dishonesty but I think just going easy on yourself mm. and respecting the fact that yesterday yeah you, you got really angry and then you calmed down and all you felt for her was love and she felt that and she didn't expect that like she has awareness that, you know, she had she had lied and it can't be an easy thing for Jesse either. You know, where Jesse's at can't be an easy thing. Mm -hmm. Having the urges to want to do the exercise. Well, what she said to me was that she actually wanted me to catch her. Yeah, she wants help. Perhaps she didn't quite know how to break it to you. <laughs> I think the other thing is she loves the feeling like when we when we talk and she tells us kind of how far she's come, she loves that kind of 
high of wow I've done really well and she's kind of enjoyed the the feedback and the interaction and I think sometimes we feel invincible at that point and then when we do maybe slip back into an old habit like the shame and 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 the guilt that can come with that and it feels like yesterday you just had some understanding for that you fell into some understanding and then you can have that for yourself also mm. yeah and bless her so i've done a terrible thing <laughs> i think a sense of perspective needs to be maintained on both sides because it's very easy to kind of destroy ourselves over things it doesn't get anybody anywhere it just create suffering Just maintain suffering. She hasn't killed anybody or anything like that. I think she just feels like she's let you down. But I know if there's one thing that I've seen and I've heard you say over and over again, <clears throat> loves the answer. I've heard you say it so many times and you just said it just then. You find yourself, you enter into this space of darkness only to find yourself finding light. You do that over and over again. That's a gift, Leanne. You're allowed to be a human being and feel and experience, but it's interesting that you, you enter into those spaces of darkness. You don't last as long as what you used to when I first met you. You come out and you find the light. And in that light, you find knowledge and compassion and love, as you've just described. That right there is the healing agent. That right there is the healing agent. You've always said it, you've said it yourself time and time again. And you are all right. And I know that you know that you are right. You're just feeling. I'll be interested to see. We'll come back in a wee bit. See how things are. Because you know it's not in the words. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you want to say something regarding this? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm only on my me, on me phone here, so I can't see everyone's names. And names is something I'm terrible with, but the lady who just spoke there, Leanne. She spoke last time when I was really struggling and she passed on some advice on one of the community groups. And I, I just, I would, I would like to say, um, I'm feeling like unstoppable today. Again, I'm feeling so uh, positive and so in control of myself. And I feel so real. Um a lot of self-love. I can see, I can see how yesterday's turnaround was such a big thing, and realizing that I'm the only thing I've, I've been struggling with is letting the outside world influence me. And I would just like to try, and and I can't believe I'm actually saying this. I'd like to send any love to people who need it. Um, I feel great, and I know the the feeling is coming from myself, and anyone who's struggling the feeling is only coming from yourself um yeah so i just want to send out love to people um yesterday really like meant a lot to us because I, I know the turnaround is because of the love and kindness that people are shown in these groups and the understanding and the knowledge that people pass on with little tips or little stories and shares and yeah that's all i'd like to say Everything's temporary. Um, granted, my happiness today might be temporary. I might be shouting and swearing this afternoon, but that's this afternoon. So, yeah, that's all I'd like to say. It's minus one. It looks like a lovely sunny day here, but it's actually freezing. Um, so I'm going to get this job finished so I can actually sit down on my laptop and really... Um, so I can actually say people's names. They'll get embarrassed about who they actually are. But, yeah. I'd just like to send love to people and yeah, it's temporary. Anything you're feeling, if you're feeling down, it's not going to last. Thank you.
Cheers, Paul. I think we kind of touched a little bit on it yesterday. It's it's so much easier often when it's like an outsider looking in to see how people have their own lives to live in their own journeys and it's I know with family members I found it much harder to kind of have respect for the fact they've got a journey and a life to live and they don't always live it how I think is best for them and I think like Paul just said that all people really need is love and and acceptance and then almost when we come from that place sometimes we do find ourselves having conversations or sharing stories but I think that's one of the things you had to learn about your friend was he's got some lessons to learn in this life yeah and every time he thought he cracked it we'd be like oh wow he's cracked it he's off and a bit like Paul said like feeling invincible and then and then he'd have a bit of a downer and he'd go back to an old habit and the last time he he realized for himself after a couple of weeks I need some more help so he's gone back into rehab and he made that decision himself and I think so many times we've tried to prevent him falling and we see how easy it is to innocently kind of stop people learning. Yeah, prop people up. And I think that's <clears throat> that's the thing, like trying to, like Paul was saying, like if we can see this for ourselves, and then how we show up with other people is different. And I think you got to experience the difference yesterday. Initially, you took it very personally and you were angry. And then for whatever reason, you just fell into a space of just love and love for Jess and I think it's just one of those things that we we gain respect for that same wisdom and insight built into life we all have and sometimes the lostness is where we we grow and gain insight and when we wake up to it a bit like Sharon's poem yesterday like the waking up and the gratitude we find we wouldn't have without the contrast. And I think that's what that poem, I don't know if you're on Leanne for, for Sharon's poem. Yeah, all right. yeah. I'll ask her, Sharon, if you can post it on the uh, Facebook page again, like I've had so many people say how much they enjoyed that. And I love that Sharon, you said yesterday that it was a gift for you too. Like it didn't yeah. come from my ego. It didn't come from me. It, it came <laughs> through me. Yeah, I would have gotten in the way. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> 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 it, it's interesting it's like we worked with the last i wish she was on actually i'll get her to share she won't mind us talking about this but she was a girl who's been in therapy since she was seven years old and she was 16 when she came 15 15, 16, 15 when she came and worked with us so just over half a life she'd spent in psychiatry and psychology medication was it three attempts at suicide three or four Self-harmer, beautiful girl. I mean, just stunning, inside and out. And she's a girl who, she came and did a, 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 a an intensive with us, with her father. And on day two, she came back and she was like, I don't even know why the hell I'm here. I don't know what the hell I can learn from you. No offence, she said. This is what she said. No offence. Dave, you've been to prison. You're hardly a good role model. And Jenny, what are you? You're just an ex-anorexic. I was like, look, no offence, Tekken. Just please understand we do this over three days. It's for a reason, because we expect this. We expect this headiness to come up and hostilities and questions and... Anyway, long story short, by lunchtime, this girl burst into tears. Day two, lunchtime, she burst into tears. Right, lunch break, went for a walk down the garden, and I just said to her, I said, Phoebes, I said, what's, what's going on? Why are you crying? And she said, I'm crying for two reasons. She said, I'm crying because I've spent so long talking about all my problems to psychiatrists and psychologists, and I've taken all this medication, and she said, but I'm crying because I've just realized I'm actually all right. I'm actually okay. Cool, right, now you can start to listen. That girl 
walked out of there flying. A few weeks later, mum texted us and said, Phoebe's cut herself again. Self-harming. But this time it's different. Where the self-harming used to bring her relief, it now brings a pain. It hurts. But because there's been this shift in consciousness, it, it stopped being a pleasurable thing that she kind of gained satisfaction from. Now it just hurts. You know, these habits that we have can die hard. Habits can die hard. We have to be prepared for that. This is not an anaesthetic to life. This is not an anaesthetic to life. This is not an anaesthetic to life. This is not about feeling good all the time. This is not anaesthetic. If we want anaesthetic, go and see a psychiatrist to get medication. If we want to live, truly live, we have to understand that it's going to come with its ups and downs. All the time. It, it just, just life. It, life is going to have its ups and downs. That's why we talk about what we talk about. Because we take these ups and downs so fucking seriously. It's easy to say, Dave, it's not your kid. I know. We take life so seriously. So wedded to life as we see it. That's why we talk about what we talk about. That's why Sid brought what he brought. I remember watching the video not so long ago. I'd never, I hadn't really watched the video since I woke up. <clears throat> but the video I watched was on YouTube of Sidney Banks. And I think the thing that hit me the most was he was talking to psychologists and he said, you're dealing with the illusion. You're trying to fix the illusion with the illusion. You think your reality is real. It's not. Is what he said. It's not real. You just think it's real. I remember that hit me so, so hard. Yes. I knew it was true. I knew it was true. Deep down in my heart, I knew it was true. And I went for a walk and I saw it. It was true. It really is true. It's a game of life we're all taking so, so seriously. When we die, we'll realise, oh, it was all a game. And we'll get to come back and do it again. This is the thing about lessons in life. It's an interesting thing. All the way through life, we have this capacity to learn. It's a given. Everybody has it. It's not a mistake that we have this capacity to learn. It's an overlooked point, I feel, in the principles. We have this capacity to learn. It is a principle in itself. Of thought. It's a principle of thought, you could say. All learning comes from consciousness and thought, so it is a consequence, but it's a principle of that. It's not by mistake. People have their lessons to learn in their life. We all have our lessons to learn in our lives. does seem the deeper people connect with themselves, their true self, not the ego, the more these lessons start to decrease. And the more we start to live in the present moment, the more we start to live in love and compassion. Which Leanne, I know you've got buckets of seen it. And you know it. Take life really, really seriously. 
and that's not that's not that genuinely 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 isn't putting anybody's experience down or belittling any anybody's experience really don't want that to come across like that experience is experience it's real it's real as an experience Sylvie, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that an observation to Leanne. She said, when does the peace come? And I think she answered the question with her opening statement that once she calmed down. So that, that was the peace then. That's when it came. And today she's feeling down, but that's most likely just an emotional reaction to an event that happened yesterday. So it's sometimes if you go for a long run, not that I've been for a run in a long time, but uh, you're tired the day after, you know, you, you experience fatigue and tiredness and, and that, that could just be all it is. So it'll, throughout the day, she'll come back to being sort of balanced again. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that she, and you said that she knows that and possibly does, but it's, it's good that she can share that she's feeling down. That's the main thing, you know. But, um, and then you know, you just touched on there about the past. And a lot of yesterday I was sort of thinking, like when you mentioned something about this, not about being passive. Um, and what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, we have experience and yes, we are in the now and that's all that exists, but experience is something that you, you learn from and that you know. That if you if you can hold your breath underwater for 10 seconds, you can do it for 10 seconds every time you do it. And you know that after 10 seconds, you'll come back up and you get more oxygen. I don't know if that's a good example, but just, you know, like if you lift weights, you know you're in pain and then it stops. And then the next time you do it, it's a little bit easier, but that's experience. That's, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Gone off track a wee bit, but uh, yeah, that's just wanted to sort of say that it was nice of her to share that she was down today, but I think she found the peace yesterday. So that, that's all. <laughs> well done. Beautiful. Beautiful, Sylvie. Extremely. Sharon. Hey. <laughs> um, I guess I just, I just want to say that, like that line I read about the nightmare infusing gratitude into the moment of waking. Like I come by that honestly. <laughs> and um, that, you know, my experience has been, there were a few years ago <clears throat> where I was, I thought I, I really didn't think I'd ever feel pain to the extent I had in the past, you know? It's almost a bit like, um, like I was happy. I would I'd never have to, now that I know this, like I'd never have to, you know, get knocked to my knees again. And I knew I'd feel hard times, but I kind of thought, oh, well, sometimes we talk about the hard times being more graceful because we, we know, we know what we know, but I wasn't graceful at all. There is nothing graceful about the next time I got knocked to my knees. In fact, in some ways, I think I had it loaded up with how could I and, you know, I share this and, and the missing of that kind of confidence. And I had a sense and, and there, were, there were just so many times like I just didn't, I really didn't want to be alive anymore. And I thought I'd never have thought that again. And I had a sense that there was something, there was something in there for, 
for life, for evolution, you know? And, but it was, it was like a little hint. It was like a little hint of a sense. And then, and then I just, I guess what I want to share is, but I still had, because of the, because, because of this understanding and what you're talking about. And, you know, I still had moments when I was fully joyful. I still had moments, you know, when I woke up, I was awake. I think that's the difference, you know, before I understood this, when I woke up, I'd get back to work on my worries about how I had fallen asleep. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd use my good moments to, I'd use my good moments to, to worry about the downs and to work on them. But what was different was that as low as my lows went, you know, and I was face down in the mud, <laughs> When any moment that I woke up, which which happened all the time, I'd be alive to life and I'd have that, I'd have that piece of life back, that moment of life back. But I guess what I'm what I'm saying is that I realized, and it I think it humbled me in a good way. That you know, whatever thought brings, whatever experience brings, whatever consciousness brings, I'm gonna feel that. And it could be as low, it could be lower. It could be absolutely shattering. But uh, Sharon, you've gone silent, look. We heard shattering. Oh, how long ago did I go silent? Sorry. <laughs> you just said it could be shattering. Oh, I don't remember, but I think I think what's been so amazing is that is that while I realize that I can I, I realize the power of the principles, I realize even more deeply that whatever consciousness brings, you know, I'll feel it, and that um, I oh I know what I was gonna say. I don't take it for granted. You know, like, I, I feel like there's a fragility, but in a beautiful way. Like, I, I don't, every moment that I feel so awake to life now, it feels like such a, a blessing and such a gift. And I know that I could get, you know, knocked to my knees again tomorrow. I know that I could be face down in the mud again tomorrow, you know. And there's something very, very beautiful about that. Almost the way, you know, that you won't live forever that infuses something into life. So there's a, it's just, it's shifted things for me. And I just, I just want to share that, that no matter how deep my understanding gets and how much richness and beauty it brings to me, um, there's, you know, what you say, Dave, like this isn't an aesthetic to life. Like that's really true. And thank God, <laughs> thank yeah. God, thank, fucking god yeah you know this is being so alive to life and uh and when it hurts it really hurts and when there's love out there to give and receive thank god for that too so i think i just want to echo paul right now and just send my love out too you know because that was such a beautiful thing you did anyway thanks thank you thank you Okay. Does anybody else have anything they would like to discuss? Observations, reflections? Or poems? Looking at Lula. She, uh, sorry, to okay. keep chipping in here. Good. Please do. I made some notes <laughs> from yesterday so that I didn't forget. You mentioned something about finding the way to teach. If somebody doesn't understand what you're saying, it's not always that they don't get it. It's maybe the way that you're putting it across. Um, and I, I tried to think of an example just in case somebody didn't quite get what you meant, but it's that 
when I was at school, I managed to fluke an exam and end up in the top maths class, which I'm not a mathematician. Um, so I spent the last three years at high school twiddling my thumbs in a math class, trying to be taught by a teacher who didn't like me um, because I couldn't learn her way. And then being a bit of a crafty cockney, I used to do a bit of work on the building sites, like go and sign in school and then go to work and earn a bit of money and then go back for lunch and all the rest of it. Uh, my uncle Pat used to do paving, right? And I, t- I told him, oh, I've got my exams coming up, Pat, and I don't understand this Pythagoras theory thing. And he's like, oh, it's simple. He says, it's, 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 what, what have they taught you? And I was like, well, I don't really know because I, I can't engage with the teacher. And he says, well, the, the, the teacher, the reason why you need to know it. And I said, no, no. He says, well, with paving and building, we use it to make things, make sure things are square. All right, so how'd you do it? He went, well, that, that I'll try and sort it. So it's like that squared plus that squared is that squared. And if that all adds up, then that's square. All right, that's simple. Why don't you just teach me like that? This is well, it's because they need to teach you all the, the proper words, all the algebra. But because you put it into a, pra- a practical thing, I could see it. I could feel it. I could do it. Do you know what? Like measure in, measure the tape and put the, the block paving down. And, and it was such a simple thing to do. And then another thing was my, my dad, quite clever in terms of sort of physics and that. And I, I wasn't struggling with vacuum, but I just didn't, I was like, what's the point of it? And he, and he showed me, like, I squashed a bottle and put the lid back on it. And there you go, there's a the vacuum, that's it. In there, there's nothing in there now. And I was like, oh, simple. And it's just, it's all about sort of changing your level. Do you know that? Like, it's like when you talk to a child, if you go down on, on your knee or go down to their level, they engage with you a lot better than if you're standing over them, sort of, you know? So, uh, just an observation from yesterday. Hope it helps. <laughs> Love that, man. It's like, what came to mind is the Einstein quote, everybody's a genius, but if you judge it, if you judge a fish and its ability to climb a tree, it will think it's stupid. Uh, and Sorry, yeah. when i read that i knew in the past i've come across actually there are fish that climb trees there's a snakehead fish and there's a climbing gunami and there's another one that i'm aware of but i can't think of its name right now so it's like genius really doesn't have any bounds and it is that isn't it it's like i, I was the same i wasn't particularly awesome at school so i, I generally grew, I grew up thinking i was stupid and I wasn't very intelligent, but it was it was as though I was measuring intelligence with A, B, C, D, E, F through to unclassified. As though you can actually measure in intelligence. You can't measure intelligence. No. You know, you can measure IQ, somebody's IQ with, it's very rudimentary, it's not very accurate. Because everybody comes to this earth with a, with a different skill set. Thank God we don't all come with the same skill set. You know, this this earth wouldn't work if we all came with the same skill set. But that's what school in my my time was trying to fit everybody into this box. And you must become like this. And well, I yeah. didn't operate. I was like you, Sylvie. I don't operate like that. And it was when I was 33 and I woke up, <clears throat> I realized, oh, no, intelligence. Intelligence is something you cannot measure. Everybody's made of it. It's infinite. You you can't measure it with numbers or letters. It's impossible. Everybody is a genius with what they are interested in. Yeah. Everybody's a genius with what they're interested in. Everybody's interested in different things. It's like our little... I was going to say also about two or three years ago, I remember you going, maths is just puzzles. I love puzzles. Why didn't someone tell me that when I was yeah. at school? Because then you would have listened different. It would have been very different. Yeah, it just hit me. Maths is just puzzles. But I remember our little nephew, Archie, nine years old, doesn't think he's, doesn't think he's very clever because he doesn't really fit into the school model. And we sat there and we're like, all right, Arch, we're older than you and bigger. But who knows more about Pokemon than me? says me i do how much more lots more you're a genius 
you're a genius in what you're interested in. And, you know, it, it's quite interesting. We went, we did some work in Johannesburg with a lot of um, Jewish kids. And they were the tweens, aren't they? So between eight and 13. And one of the mothers came up to us and said, it broke my heart, broke my fucking heart. I couldn't believe what I heard. She said, I'm telling you now, 95% of these children are on psychiatric drugs. I'm looking at these little beautiful kids all sat in a circle, yabbering away to themselves and talking to each other and playing. Why? They're not concentrating at school. Anxious. Anxious. Are you are kidding me. Kids always get labels at school. And my argument is the child shouldn't get the label. It's the school that should be getting the label. The child's an individual space of consciousness that's interested in its own thing. And when I wasn't interested in something, I didn't learn about it. No. That's not mental illness. It's just, if somebody isn't interested in something, they're not going to learn about it until it becomes interesting to them. And it sounds to me like your uncle made it interesting for you. You weren't thick. You just weren't interested in the way you were being taught. And I get it. And I think this is something that we really need to address in the schooling system because so many kids are getting labels and these labels are something that they can carry through life and through time and they can start to think they're different. They're not different. They're just, they're just not interested in the way they're being taught. The school should be getting the label, not the child. No, it's an awesome point, dude. Thank you very much. It's not, not quite the same sort of thing, but I heard Brian O'Driscoll in an interview once and they described the difference between um, is it wisdom and knowledge. And it's like, you maybe heard this one, it's like knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Do you know, and it's like a little quirky thing and it just completely shut down the whole press conference because all the all the journalists were like, do you know? So yeah, but I mean, it's it's all to do with perspective, everything. It's, yeah, yeah. So, Absolutely, mate. I'm go back on mute again now for a bit. Give somebody else a chance to speak. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Sylvie. Beautiful, buddy. Pen. I actually did write something this morning before we started. So I'll read that out if, if you'd like to hear it. Um, I called it a different space. There is a space inside, a small space, just big enough to hold a small feeling, a joyous moment, but also encompassing the universe. When you fill that space with joy and wonder and love, it opens like a flower blooming and opening its petals to the sun. It stores everything you hold there and lets it grow and bloom. This space is connected directly to your heart and can flood your soul with light, warmth and beauty. All the intelligence and wisdom of the world is stored there too, ready for you to tap into when you need it. But that small sweet place also holds grief, anger and insecurity. Sometimes when that happens, we shut down that connection to our heart. We allow cold tendrils of disconnection to creep in and wrap themselves around our hope and our dreams. We may seek other artificial means to rekindle that feeling, but while these things may bring momentary respite, they are not the answer. It's easier than you think. Take a breath, sit in nature, drop down into that space and fill it with love again. Feel the flow as that tiny space expands and welcomes you back, brings you home to you, to your wisdom. Let the space do its work. It can turn grief for something lost into joy for what was shared. It can turn anger into compassion. It can turn insecurity into absolute certainty that everything is or will be okay. That you are perfect in all your imperfection. That there is space inside for all of it and more. 
Yeah, what pen is it? Lorraine just gave you a heart. Sharon saying so beautiful. Beautiful Penny, thank you so much, love. Do you want to put that on the Facebook page? If you're happy to, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be yeah. lovely. Thanks, Penny, love. It'd be lovely to share that with people. Thank you. Lula. I wasn't sure you were going to get to me. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Okay, so I've got a poem, strangely. Um, in fact, I just had a look through to see which one, and I can't remember the one I read last time, so I thought I'll just do this. It felt like the right one in the moment, but it's on the thing I'm looking at here, so I'm hoping, I, I can still hear you, but I can't see anything. Is that okay? Yeah, cool, okay, right. Let me go to it. It's called Birthing the Impossible. From nothing comes something so great and so bold. It begins as an idea and then it's out in the world. We are creative potential, each one of us here. So put down the inner critic and watch magic appear. The ones who succeeded, who created and changed, birthed the impossible, we're no different from them. They believed it and they did it with no judgment or self-hate. They got out of their own way in order to create. To make a difference, to change the world, we are all born the same. We are magic in motion, creating our dreams. So when the idea takes a hold of you, embrace it, my love, and watch it grow. Abandon the I'm not good enough and fly in the face of what if, what if. Watch out for reality holding you back, telling you that you're not good enough and pointing to lack. Give birth to that idea, the one that gives you life. Even if you can't see the path, it's hidden in plain sight. Hold on to your inspiration and watch it come alive. See life take a hold of it and watch that baby thrive. Because your passion, your great idea, is a message from your soul. It's telling you why you're here and whispering gently, let's go. I'm not sure whether that's the one I read before, but if it is, it's out there again. I love poetry. It's a, it's a different one to the one you read last time. Oh, is it? Oh, good. I'm so glad. I couldn't remember. I love poetry. What I love about poetry is it's the words but they kind of the how feeling sound almost and again if you're happy to post that on the facebook page i'm sure people would like to read it again yeah thanks lovely i'm oh, sorry yeah i am i'm happy to post it just oh, so sometimes <laughs> it's got you reading it on youtube so if you have that then that's uh, oh yeah yeah i can do that i can do that yeah sure Okay, awesome. I've got a little, a little man here that's come to, to see. Hey, I'm dude. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Good, good. Looks a nice cuddle. Yeah, he's, he's good with his cuddles. <laughs> good lad. Good lad. Look after that skill. <laughs> Thanks, Lulu. Yeah. Miss Strimley. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, <laughs> it's Sharon's, Sharon's Strimley, voice is you, a little deeper. You need to cough and clear your throat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wanted to share an insight that I had a couple of years ago. Um, but then hearing all of this beautiful poetry, I find, found my mind scrambling around to see if I could quickly put it into a haiku or something. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not going to be nearly as eloquent as the last few speakers, but, um, you know, I, like everyone here, um, I've experienced my share of pain and, um, 
but I've also been able to see how I've taken that and elevated it to true, true suffering. Um, and, you know, I used to um, fear these feelings, uh, specifically loneliness. I would fear lonely, loneliness like, like people fear death, like literally um, do anything. Not, not, didn't fear being alone, but just that, that loneliness feeling. Um, and I had an experience one night as I laid down uh, to go to bed and I just, like I felt this twinge in my stomach. Um, and then immediately right on its heels, so, so immediate that it was almost imperceptibly different. Like it, it happened instantaneous the story in my mind began. And my, my mind again, like scrambled to try to attribute this sensation to something. And the story just took off and it was, you know, that's that feeling that's, oh, um, that's, that's from when my, my ex left and it just went from there and quickly this twinge became suffering. And somehow I was able to, to pause and say, no, wait a minute, that twinge, that's, that's a feeling, that's what you fear. Go, you know, go back to the twinge, just forget everything else. Just go back to the feeling, sense the feeling. I found myself just diving into that sensation and focusing intently, exclusively on the sensation that the, the sensation that I would like at every opportunity turn away from. Um, and when I did there, did that and really felt it, I was amazed. It was, um, it was playful. It was, it was like butterflies dancing. It was, um, there was a lightness to it. There was um, just, um, you know, it, it was, it was like, literally, and I've described this to Sharon, it was like a five-year-old tugging on my pant leg, just wanting my attention, just wanting me to, to focus and um, acknowledge it. Um, and so I did that. I just sat with it. Uh, and it was interesting because it was hard to, it was hard to tell the difference if there was any difference between discomfort or elation. I really couldn't tell you what it, what it was. It was just a sensation. Um, and I just kind of followed it for a little while and then it just melted and it was gone. Um, and that changed everything for me. That's um, all of the feelings are still there, um, but the fear is gone. None of them, they're, they're just feelings. And when they come upon me, I just, pause and let myself feel them and it's just um you know that there's something to it uh i think someone talked you know made, made the mention yesterday of of sid banks and him being more mercurial than than his wife and you know i've always been up um curious about equanimity and what exactly did that mean did that mean being dead to the feelings and and it's not but I, I guess it's just being comfortable with them and welcoming every one of them that that might come along us you know, that's all I think what you've described there John is you described how innate all this is You know, this is it. What we're talking about here isn't a way to be. It's not a way to be. It's not a it's not a modality of being. We're just talking about life. And how we can learn through life. What you had there, you described, you said you had an insight, and it's like 
since like Bill said yesterday, in that moment of insight, you touch that space of divinity where new information is born, a new thing comes into your world, a new, a new experience is born into your world that takes the old and makes it redundant. We do that with technology all the time. A new technology comes into our mind, into our experience, and it makes the old redundant. As we almost upgrade our consciousness. That's a metaphor. Or just words. But I love that, John, because it's the most natural thing. It's the most natural thing that we we do. We've all done it. We've all done it throughout our lives. Perhaps we haven't always been aware of it until we come across a conversation like this and then we, we start to go, oh, yeah. Shit, that is true. Get to look back at our own lives and see where we've learned from ourselves, from an, an experience. No, it was eloquent, dude. Thank you very much. I think as well, it just described freedom. Like, I think we've just talked about yesterday that people often think that understanding this, that freedom would mean freedom from certain feelings or experiences. Yeah. And what you described was the freedom from the fear of experience. And it didn't stop certain feelings but you no longer were afraid of them and i think that's that's the truest sense of freedom because we are here alive and we're going to feel stuff like sydney banks would always say you know life is a contact sport you're going to get, your, get your, knocks. your knocks i think this is a really fundamental point as well freedom because that's what we're talking about when we were working in Johannesburg, we actually, when we met Leanne, it was through Leanne that we actually went there. We went to this charity called Redeeming Hope for the Disabled, run by a man called Gordel Sefu. Anybody who's going to the big conference this year, um, hopefully you'll see Gordel. I encourage you to go and listen to him. Gordel was a, a refugee from the Congo physically disabled in a wheelchair, underwent xenophobic attacks, petrol bombs in Soweto, township of Soweto. And we had the privilege to be introduced to him and give talks in his um, charity. In his charity. And I remember one man came up to me and he said, he said, Dave, you can't talk to us about freedom, mate. You're white. You don't understand the suppression we go through. And the only thing that occurred to me at that time was to ask this man to go and stand against a wall, facing the wall with his arms and legs open. And I said, right, I said, I want you to imagine something now. I said, I want you to imagine I put big, steel straps, strapped you to the wall around each wrist. And I've strapped your ankles to the wall, locked them, you are fixed to the wall now. Totally suppressed your body, I said, and just for good measure, I said, I'm gonna put one around your neck so all you can face is the wall. I said, no, I've totally suppressed you. I said, I'm gonna walk away and you're not gonna know whether I'm gonna come back and feed you or whether I'm going to let you go. You don't know anything. I said, now, is it possible whilst you're in that state, do you think it would be possible that you could think about a worrying time in the future? Yeah. Do you think it's possible whilst you're fixed to the wall that it would be possible for you to think about a time in the past which was horrific? Yeah. I said, but do you think in, whilst you're strapped to the wall, you could think about a beautiful time in the past? Is that possible? Yes. Do you think it'd be possible to think about your childhood? Fun that you had in your childhood? 
Yes. Could you be within your mind whilst you're strapped to the wall? Could you? Do you think you could have optimism at some point? Suppose so, yes. Do you think you could dream up poetry, I said to him? I suppose I could. Yeah. Your mind is always free. Your mind is never suppressed. Your mind is totally free all the time. The only thing that creates the illusion of suppression is the mind. And that's not to say, and I'm, I need to be very careful what I'm saying here. I need to be very, very careful. Because I don't want to upset anybody. Perhaps I'll explain it another way with a, a, another story whilst we're in Cape Town this time. A man in a homeless who was homeless, came in late to a shelter that Jen and I were working in. There was 300 homeless people in this shelter, all black, apart from two who were white. Massive black homeless problem in, in Cape Town. And this man walked in, he was about, he was about Paul Mackey's size. Anybody who doesn't know Paul, he's fucking man mountain. Six foot six, built like a brick shit house. This man walked in carrying his plastic bags and he had beaten up eyes. And I remember looking at him and I walked up to him and I, I just said, are you okay? What's happened to your face? And he said, I was beaten. I was jumped and I was beaten. I said, who jumped you? And <laughs> you were looking up at this man thinking, who would jump you? And he said, four o'clock in the morning, four men came into the park and they beat me and took my things. just looked at this man, I looked up at this man and I said, wow, that must have been terrifying. And he looked back at me and he pointed at me and he said, you'd be scared. And I said to him, yeah, I think I would be scared if four men came into my room and beat me and took my things. And he said, he just said to me, I will never be afraid of my brothers. The only person I truly need to be afraid of is you. And the only thing at that time that came out of my mouth was I'm stood in the middle of this, these 300 people, different gangs in there. And you could see the gangs on different sides of the tables, like staring at each other, not taking their eyes off each other for a moment. And this massive man and I stood in the middle of this room having this conversation and he's getting angry because I'm a white man stood in front of him. The only person I need to be afraid of is you. I shit myself. And I looked up at this man and the only thing that came out of my mouth was, why, what have I done? And he said, you white man, you suppress me. You suppress us. I didn't know what to say. I hadn't gone there with the intention of upsetting him. The only thing that I, that came to me in that moment was, I'm so sorry, can you please do me a favour? He said, what's that? I said, can you, can you please point to the suppression? He said, what do you mean, can I point to the suppression? I said, please, can you point to the suppression? What do you mean, can I point to the suppression? You're going to have to touch it. Please, friend, you're going to have to touch the suppression unless I can see it. I can't do anything about it. And I'd like to do something about it. What do you mean? How can I touch suppression? And then we started to have a conversation. I told him what I'd learned about life. How all experience, all experience is a generation of consciousness. The way we believe is how the world appears. As Jesus said, it is done unto you as you believe. I talked to him about that. We had about a conversation for about 20 minutes. It's not what I, it's not really what I'd recommend. It was just what happened to him in that moment. And this massive man suddenly burst into tears and fell into a chair behind him.
and I sat down in front of him. And this massive, hostile man, these were his words. He said, my brother, you've just set me free. I said, what do you mean? He said, you've set me free. I'm free. And I just said to him, my brother, I didn't set you free. You set you free. You freed yourself. And he leant forward and he gave me the biggest hug and we just fell in love. Me and this man just fell in love. I love that man so dearly. I think about him now and I love that man so dearly. No idea where he's at. Don't even know if he's still alive. He was the last person to leave. He stood up. He was bewildered. It was like he'd just been put on earth for the first time. He'd just been put on earth. He was like, he didn't know where to look. He was like, you could see his world had been shattered. It was one of the most beautiful moments. I treasure that moment. It was so scary. It was a time, a moment where two people who appeared very different became the same. All our differences dropped. And we just united in knowledge and love. And I remember that day, that day our friend came came with us from Johannesburg. Serious, Cape Town. Cape Town, sorry. Seriously wealthy Jewish lady. And when she left, she just burst into tears and she was like, Look at this. The problem's too big. How are, they, how are we going to deal with the problem in, of South Africa? Look at this division. And Jen and I looked at her and went, no, it's not. The problem facing South Africa is not big at all. It's tiny. When people start to think differently about one another, will start to treat each other different. The only thing standing in South Africa's way is beliefs, thoughts. It's the only thing that's standing in South Africa's way is thoughts. And when South Africa's thoughts start to change about each other, the country will have to change. If we think the problem that South Africa faces is things like sorting out the equity and housing and fair rights jobs all those things land yeah it looks overwhelming but when we understand the moment people's minds change all those problems change those problems are created from thought and they're solved by thought all thought And that man realized suppression existed the moment he the moment he encountered a white man he felt suppression and that was a belief that you know you could say that that's been a generation after generation after generation after generation belief a very widely held belief a very you could say a deeply entrenched um, neural pathway if you want to say that that's what neurologists would talk about deep deeply held belief change in the moment for that man didn't have to work on himself his mind changed and then his whole world changed and it's a telling point when the mind changes the world changes but when the mind changes the world looks different what is this world that we see also i think what's so interesting is you went from being you white man to my brother and so quickly the differences vanished. And I think we experienced that so much out in South Africa. We went in pretty naive. Naive and, as fuck. I yeah. mean, I would definitely do a lot more reading and have more understanding before I went back into a township and did the work, you know, in hindsight. But it was so cool because you can see how with this conversation quickly division and idea of separate separateness starts to dissolve. And the people that we've worked with in different communities and with Goodell and his um, refugee charity, on the outside, we seem so different. 
And I know there's been moments where we think, who are we to go and speak within this community about love and peace and through principles? And they just need help with housing and food and all of those things. But I always remember that first training we did with Godel's group was on the second day, like a young guy, maybe 19 years old, came up to me and goes, on the first day that you arrived, we thought they're going to be bringing us stuff. Money. Yeah. Money. And uh, we were a bit disappointed. He said, but after listening the last couple of days, he said, I, I see that what you've brought to us is far more valuable. And he started sort of using examples from his own life where he'd gone beyond limitation and come up with ingenious ideas. And yeah. he was just such a cool kid. And, and then he sent us a picture of something like 100 kids. He was stood in front of and he, he'd started his own thing and he called it free thinking. But I think it was... I know that when I learned from Dr. Roger Mills, there was something about how he worked in communities as this white privileged psychologist, he had, he had no, he didn't have eyes for difference. He only had eyes for what was the same within us. And I think you can see if we look at the superficial, then there is always gonna be difference and there's gonna be judgment of, you know, when we had to sit there and, and, and within this charity, they were really interested about us and our story. So I talked to them a little bit about my story you know how did I come across the three principles so oh I struggled with anxiety and depression and I had eating disorders and they I had to explain to them what eating disorders were and it felt so uncomfortable speaking to people that had gone without food who had seen their families murdered who had limbs missing been part of such atrocities and I felt so embarrassed by my own suffering but all I was met with was love and understanding and kindness. And that's one of the things we saw so much within that group, how they were serving one another and people that were more able helping others. And there was no judgment for them about suffering being to do with circumstance. They saw that suffering was an inside job. And it was one of the most, I learned so much from that about life. I learned so much about my own ego of who I thought I could reach with this conversation, but it was definitely that whole trip was about us seeing our own ego and us learning more about our true nature as human beings that I, I could imagine. And I think this conversation transcends circumstance, past, color, creed, age, like it's, it's, it's what unites. And I think today we wanted to talk about love without limits and just lifting, listening to different people this morning, you can hear how finding it for ourselves, within ourselves, finding it for all experience and not being so afraid like it's so easy to have a limit on what we think we can love mm. and what we think is possible yeah, it's a bit early. yeah. we haven't it's an unscheduled should we have a quick 10 minute break because we've realized we've gone for quite a while um so if we just come back at half past Sabia, we're just going to have a quick unscheduled 10 minute break. So sorry that you've just joined, but we're back at half past. Oh, that's cool. It gives me 10 minutes to say to my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> Dave needed another coffee, so we had to have a, a little break. Right. At least it's not cocaine. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Okay, so just before the break, um, one of the things I wanted to finish off saying about that was 
after the work we've been doing in the townships and with Goodell's um, refugee charity, we then went and worked with a pretty wealthy community and, and did different one-to-ones and um, intensives and kind of a lot of work. And I found myself getting really kind of judgmental and thinking, you know, these things are trivial. Other parents looking at you funny at the school gate or feeling left out or anxious about money and and then I caught myself I saw my own ego in there's certain things that I thought were worthy of suffering and certain things that I thought weren't and I was attributing a feeling of suffering to external sources and I really had to check myself and I got to see how actually the, su the suffering and the struggling that people that I was talking to were going through was just as real, just as hard, just as painful as any anyone else I'd spoken to in all those different groups. And I think that's the, the beautiful thing about the privilege we've had of working with people from all different walks of life. You see that what's inside what we're made from is the same. And if we suffer, we suffer our mind. And in the same way, you know, for a small child, them having their sweets taken away from them is like the worst thing ever and they suffer and they cry and they have a tantrum. But we'll be like, oh, that's trivial. But then if somebody has money worries, oh, no, that's real world stuff. That's worthy of worry and upset. And I think you can't get to the end of, of, of seeing and noticing how quickly we jump to the, the false paradigm, the untruth of that there is something or some circumstance or some life event that causes experience or feeling. And I remember Keith Blevins um, saying that he came across this book called Indiv Individual Differences in Post-Traumatic Stress Response. And he said this whole book in a way was evidence to what, what Sidney Banks had uncovered and what Sidney Banks had seen, because there was all different stories within this um, book. And like the first page, I used to have a photograph of it, was saying people were crying in um, on a beach, wailing and, absolutely beside themselves and there was two children crying in the a square in China when an execution was happening a man wrote in a book about the most beautiful peaceful time of his life and then the next page was the people on the beach crying and screaming were upset because they'd offered themselves to the sharks but because the sharks had already eaten they didn't get eaten so they thought they were unworthy of God they were part of some cult. And then the children crying in the square in China was because they couldn't see the execution. So when their father lifted them onto their, his shoulders, they quickly stopped crying and they were satisfied that they could see. And then the man that wrote about the most beautiful time of his life was a man who had been in a concentration camp and he'd spoke about his insights. And then this whole book, she goes on to say that it can be that something happens in someone's life that seemingly looks small, but then they go on to have such a traumatic stress response to it. And then something else in someone else's life could happen that seems huge, seemingly the most traumatic thing you could imagine, but then they go on to live a life not of trauma. And our whole book was posing the question, well, what is the um, discriminator in that? And then Keith said he got so excited, he arranged a meeting with this woman. And he said, I probably went in a bit over the top because I was like, I've got the answer to your whole book. I've got the answer. And I don't think it went as well as he'd hoped, but he said it was so cool to see that more and more people are posing the question because we have lived in a, in a belief and a paradigm that if this happens and there's this response, but he was saying, well, no, that, that isn't true. 
We've lived in the paradigm of an external reality, haven't we? It's definitely, it's, it's quite a heady read, but it's a good read if anyone's interested. If nobody minds, I was going to do a bit of a diagram, which I feel many people have said they find it helpful. So, let me bring that forward a little bit. Can you all see that? Kelly, you shook your head and then put your thumbs up. Okay. It's quite small. It is quite small. Um, can we move the table forward? We, can we bring this forward? Stand that off. See that? Is that any better? It's a bit of a shadow as well, but yeah, it's a bit better. All right. Forgive me if you've already seen this. I think Sharon was on this retreat when we were in Grasmere. And we went for a walk to go and see the tree we talked about yesterday. Yep. Yeah. Went to see the larch tree. And we've got a friend, a beautiful friend. And she had lots of questions. Lots and lots of questions. Dave, what are you talking about? What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And this retreat that we were holding was in Grasmere, which is in the heart of uh, the Lake District in England. Beautiful place. And this lady was like, but I have these thoughts. And I have these thoughts. Jane, I see you smiling. Have you been to Grasmere, Jane? You're smiling like you've been. Can't hear you. Sorry, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's just really funny because when you you just mentioned the Lake District, and um, I, I just got that feeling, you know, because it's just so beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. But and you're not that, even that's, there. Isn't that interesting? I'm not even there, but. But I know it's yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, well, yeah. This is a this is a representation of Grasmere. Okay. In fact, this is exactly how Grasmere looks. Really, if anybody who's ever been there will know that Grasmere it looks just like this. Right. But we're walking along, me and my friend Sasha, and she was saying, "But what about this thought? Where does that fit in?" Where does that fit into the principles? And what about this thought? But I have this thought. And what if somebody has this thought? What about people who are like this? All these questions, all these questions, all these questions. We're stood on the edge of Grasmere and I'm like going, look, Sash, you and I are, you and I are having two very different conversations. And I'm looking around, I'm like, what can I use as a metaphor? Stood right in the shores of Grasmere. That'll do. probably better described as an ocean because an ocean's infinite so make from it what you take from it whichever way you want i'll probably talk about it from both but it's all the same thing where's my pencil and i said to her i pointed out of the water I said sash what do you see on top of the water she said waves I said, all right, tell me about these waves. What do you tell me about them? She said, well, they come and go. The temporary. They appear to flow. They appear to be moving in a direction. 
she just carries on looking. She said, they're all different sizes. They all appear different. I said, that wave over there and that wave over there, what are they made of? She said, water. I said, is it made of the same water? She said, yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know what you're talking to me about? Uh, you're right then, Don. I said, what you're talking... Time, sorry. Love. I said, what you're talking to me about, you're talking to me about things like money. You're talking to me about things like the past. You're talking to me about things like the, the future anxiety what's true what's false what's good what's bad i said you were very much in the realms of talking about getting really really fixated on these waves you were looking at this and where there was you can take this diagram and you can put anything you like on there. Anything you like. And I said, this is what people get mesmerized by. You know, when we go down to the ocean and we stand on the beach and we look out to sea, all we see is the surface character of the ocean. It's all we can see. Sometimes we'll go there and sometimes we've been to Grasmere and it's been really, really kind of turbulent and powerful and fairly big waves on Grasmere. You go to the ocean, there's a photograph upstairs in mum and dad's office upstairs of, an, of a wave which we saw on the coast of Scotland at Port, Port William hitting the, hitting the, the um, seawall, <clears throat> covering the houses behind it. Waves like you would not believe this storm could come and create this havoc that we saw washing boulders up onto the into the houses like that. I was throwing boulders like that at the houses. I mean, it was it was catastrophic. I had to go and help an old lady, 90 year old lady who said, I've never seen it like this. I've lived here all my life. I had to help her through these waves of big boulders getting thrown every road was covered in boulders. The house was washed out. That was the sea. We went back the next day, it was flat calm. Couldn't believe it, you couldn't believe that the day before it was throwing boulders at the houses. I'll, I'll get the photograph later on and just show you because it's such, a, such an amazing thing. I said, this is like our mind. We're always looking for truth in something that comes and goes this temporary nature we're always looking for truth in something that's flowing it doesn't sit still waves don't sit still we're always looking for truth in something that appears different all the time and we we start to associate ourselves with these things so Anxiety, for example, I'm an anxious person. I'm an anxious person, or, or perhaps I'm an addict. I'm a good person. Or perhaps you may judge somebody else and go, they're bad people. You maybe have your idea as to what you think is false, what you think is possible, what you think is impossible. The thing is about waves, they all look so real. But they're an illusion. All these things that we start to identify ourselves with, we start to identify ourselves with the past. When that happened, that created who I am now. I can't change that thing now, but and it's, sadly, it's created who I am now. That 
thing that happened to me when I was 10 years old, the thing that happened to me when I was 30 years old, the thing that happened last year, the thing that happened yesterday. <clears throat> it's created who I am now and it's created my, my, um, my reality. You could say that all the waves on the ocean or on Grasmere are the reality of Grasmere in that moment. So it appears like the reality of the waves throwing the boulders and smashing over houses. It was the character of the ocean in that time, the North Sea. And so we, get, we stare blindly at these waves, mesmerized by these waves, because it's all we can see on the everyday, day-to-day -day experience of going to the beach. It's all we get to see. And I remember explaining this to a man, a deep sea diver, works on the rigs out in the North Sea. He works, in fact, I think he's out in Bahrain at the moment. And I said to him, I said, Chris, I said, when you get in the water, you'll be able to answer this question. I said, Chris, when you get in the water and you get into the North Sea and you're descending down, I said, what's it like when you first get in? He said, well, when I first get in, he said, it, it's really choppy. It's Friggin' freezing, it's really choppy. And he said, I'm getting thrown about. So what's it like when you get 10 meters down? He said, it's still. He said, 10 meters down, there is no movement. I, I sit there sometimes and he said, and I look up and I cannot believe what's happening on the surface all this choppiness going on big waves 10 meters down absolute stillness silence he said i'm not getting moved at all he said it's so peaceful so what's well, like us That's like us. I said, because the biggest problem that a human being faces is a misidentification. We become so mesmerized by what the ocean's doing. The character of the ocean. We become so mesmerized by it. So mesmerized by the comings and goings of these waves these temporary ever flowing different waves that come through our being the ones we start to identify with you know what makes the good wave is exactly the same stuff that makes the bad wave. If you were to take a sample from this wave and take a sample of this wave and take it to the to a laboratory and say, could you please tell me what's the difference between these two waves? There were two different waves. I took samples from two different waves. Can you tell me, you tell me what the difference is in their construction? And the, the scientists would go, it's exactly the same, it's water. If you take a sample of any wave, it will always be made of water. No matter if it's the wave that's going over the house or it's the tiniest of ripples. Take it to a laboratory, it'll say, it's water. It's all the same thing. Oh, but they looked so different. You don't understand. I mean, this wave was enormous. It was covering a house. It was throwing boulders, drenching an old lady. That wave was just a tiny ripple. There must be a difference. No, no, Dave, it's, it's water. It's all water. Okay, I get it. They might have appeared different. But they were, they were just water, Dave. This is where we end up. We end up mesmerized by these waves. Because that's all we can see. Until we start to descend and start to realize something about the waves 
oh, the waves are just a superficial expression of something greater. That's what the waves are. They're a superficial expression of something greater. All this time, we've been studying the form the ocean has taken, trying to change the waves. <gasps> Anxiety wave. Anxiety wave. What do most people do when the anxiety wave comes up? They walk out into their water, they see the anxiety wave and they go, get down, anxiety wave, stop, stop being turbulent, see? Stop being turbulent. Try and smash the, the wave back into the sea, trying to stop the turbulence. Because we think, this wave is something so permanent and fixed, who we are, who we are in that moment. The biggest problem humanity has faced isn't the waves. It's never been the waves. They've been the things that we think is the problem, these waves. When I no longer have waves, or when I only have pretty waves, I'll be all right. Pretty wave. It's a really pretty wave. Still a wave. It's still a misidentification. You can put anything on there. You can put your career, you can put your sex, sexuality, put your religion. They're all waves. Health. Health waves. Color, creed, waves, just waves. It's all ideas. The human's biggest problem it has ever faced is it has identified itself as waves. It has been the ocean misidentifying itself as a wave. Where do all waves come from? They come from you. They come from you. Well, if they're coming from you, are you the waves? Are you all these things that Perhaps we've identified ourselves with. Anything we think we are is a wave. This is the beautiful point about reality, the beautiful point about spirit. Anything we think we are is ego. A misidentification, an illusion of separation. We call them waves as though they are something separate from the ocean, as though they are, we create a separate term for them, as though there's something separate, different, to identify them as something different from the whole. We give them the term waves, ripples, whatever you want to call them, tsunamis, tsunamis, water. I felt what felt like tsunamis in my lifetime. The human being's biggest problem it's ever faced is it has identified itself with the waves, not realizing it is the whole, it's the ocean. You could call this ocean, you could call it your true self. Some people call it God. Pure consciousness. Call it the power of thought. Call it mind, call it spirit. Whatever you want. We're not the waves. 
none of us are the waves these are all characteristics of of minds minds think thoughts come and go experiences come and go they're temporary like paul mackie said this morning they flow through they may appear to stick around for a while but they flow through yeah they do all appear different but they're all the same thing no matter what they show up like they're all an illusion like a wave is an illusion of the ocean they're all the same thing Oceans have had atom bombs dropped on them or exploded from within them. You might see these videos where you see the ocean suddenly like blown, smashed out of itself. Big mushroom cloud. It's also had meteorites strike it at thousands and thousands of miles an hour. Ocean. They've taken some hammer in the past of the oceans but they've never been broken yet they can't be broken can't break an ocean no matter how hard you hit it with a stick no matter how many bombs you drop on it it can't be broken it can experience waves Every single wave is always an expression of water. It's all the same thing. They just appear different. And this is the thing that when we start to see this, it's like this is where the peace starts to come in. When we can see that all experience is thought, like all waves are an expression of water, no matter what the expression, it's always going to be the water. It has to be the water. It can't be anything else. No matter how it's appearing, no matter what form it's taking on. It's always water. When we can start to see that, we are none of these things that come and go. We are this thing from which, this magic from which all this emerges. We identify ourselves less with our experiences, thoughts and feelings. That's why Jesus said, he was crucified for saying before Abraham, I am. Which was heard at the time as, oh, you're above Abraham. It, was, it wasn't his point. He was saying the truest state of being is this, I am. Anything following that statement, I am anxious. I am an addict. I am male, whatever it is, I am rich. They're all, they're all misidentifications. They're all misidentifications. When we start to see the singular, the non, the non-dual, aspect of ourself the singular from which all expressions appear to take place and look different when we start to become aware of the ocean we start to find that stillness and the way you know that you are starting to stumble upon this is you start to feel stillness and quiet you start to feel peace and unity and love if we're not in a space of love for no good reason it's because we're lost in ocean stuff we're lost in the in the superficial surface of our own minds we're so mesmerized by our own creations that we're identifying with them this is the only thing that creates all the problems in the world is people have waves and think that's re that the real this is why sid said your reality is not real it appears real. You think it's real. It's not real. It really appears real, but it's not real. It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion, like the waves on the ocean are an illusion of the ocean. Become aware 
this is why talking about thoughts is a waste of time. If we wanted to, if in this conversation, many people want to talk about thoughts. We don't want to talk about thoughts. We want to talk about the ocean. Thoughts come and go. Thoughts are temporary. Thoughts are expressions of, an, of something deeper. Wake up to the deeper. Whatever we're thinking now is an expression of the ocean. It's an expression of you. It's not who we are, though. It's not a fact. This is the nature of the spiritual. Because all reality is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. It's all a play of spirit. As John was saying yesterday, you know, it's all science is a study of spirit. Whether we like it or not. So I just wanted to share that. And I hope people find that useful. Just had one. Yep. Do you want to go then? <laughs> um, has anyone got anything they want? Dave was like, it's break time. I'm like, yeah, but no, we, only, just on we only had one half an hour ago. Um, so if we go probably until half 12 and then we'll have a 15 minute break. Um, does that make sense to people? Or is there things that kind of occur? Because one, one of the things that occurs, because I know Dickon uses the metaphor of the ocean in terms of, you know, these being individual people but we're all built and made of the same stuff. And so it can be used in either way because at essence, there is not two. It's a phrase that um, Mahima, who's a lady that we met through going to Nepal um, after the earthquakes, she said, in our culture, we grow up with the idea and they have a word to describe not two. There's only one, and I think it's Advaita, Advaita or some, something like that. I always get it wrong, and I'm like, Mahima, can you voice text it to me again? And then I still get it wrong. But she just said, when she started learning about the principles, and she had us go in and share with her dad's business. Um, she got us into the hospitals, within the school system, and then just some small community groups. What she observed about the message that, that the principles brings was that she felt like it was only her generation that had forgotten and started to kind of compete and they could get the incentive of more money means they would work more. The West was winning in that country, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, she said, but if, you, if she spoke to her parents or her grandparents, it was about, well, they'd work to have enough to live. But they wouldn't then go, well, yeah, but you could earn more if you did overtime. They're like, well, why would I do that? I just need enough to live. And she said it wasn't like competition and climbing on top of one another. But she said she, she really saw in her generation how the, material, the materialistic ideal had kind of taken over. But she said when we were talking to her, her parents and the people within her, her dad's organisation, it was almost like they're like, yeah. Like this, this is nothing new. And Sid knew that this wasn't anything new. It was something that's been covered up. It's something that's kind of been lost to us in our confusion. But I think you can see the complete innocence in the confusion. Like the moment we open our eyes, we see other, we see outside, we see a world. And these waves, these oceans are mesmerizing. Our creations are mesmerizing. But none of us, like, we normally have things like joy and peace and Lovely. happiness and things on here because none of us complain about the joy wave or the happiness wave. But we just, we appreciate it. But as soon as we have the idea of like, 
good feelings and bad feelings and doing life right and doing life wrong, any of those dualities create suffering for us. And I feel like the this understanding is putting everything back together again as one, uniting everything as one. And Sid would say that he was bringing psychology and spirituality back together. He said, because it's only, it's a false split. It doesn't actually exist. And it feels, it gives us an opportunity to think again and think again and think again. And know that we are the creators of our experience of our life. We can use, like you often say, you know, with our imagination as kids, a stick could become a sword. Like I know I used to play games with my cousins and we were, you know, play with the babies and we really were going out for our lunch and we were doing these things and parents would be like, right, lunchtime. And I would, no, what do you mean? Like we're, this whole game, it was completely real. You're lost in it. We actually have a friend who, um, her mum, I think she passed away when she was 96 and she'd written this beautiful, um, poem about time <laughs> someone's just delivered a package i put i put a sign on the door saying please just leave packages on the doorstep recording and she read it and then just shoved it through the post box <laughs> it might be important documents <laughs> but she wrote how time is such a subjective thing like in childhood those you know, five more minutes of play seemed like forever. And then if your alarm clock's going to go off and you get a five minute snooze, it's nothing. And she's written this amazing poetry about how we, she saw the nature of creation and she saw how she talked about going through the weather, of the weathers of the mind of life and how in her older age, she did not care what people thought. She didn't try and be someone and she just saw how all the different characters that played out in her lifetime and none of them were her and I wish we brought that book with us because there's a couple of poems in that where I'm just like so many people have moments where this message is revealed to them and then they put it into a poem yeah. or a song or a piece of music or that's a piece what, of art that's what poetry is isn't it like something moves us to create and like we often say, like in dreams, we freely create and you can go from talking to someone and then suddenly they like morph into someone else or, you know, you're in one country and suddenly you're in another, like time, space, distance doesn't exist in dreams. And I remember hearing in one of Sid's talks, he said, the dream state is closer to the truth than when we're awake. Because we don't, and I was saying like, sometimes I can have really awful dreams, but, and I wake up remembering them. And then within 10 minutes, it's almost like it's this wisp. You're like, oh, I had this dream, but I can't quite remember it. And it's mad that we, we have our own kind of nightmares or turmoil in our life, in our, in our daydreams, but we hold on to it. And like something about, knowing that it's not real, it's just a dream at night, seems to allow us to naturally, so so many of our dreams that are so vivid when we first wake up just vanish. And you're like, I can't quite remember it. But for some reason, things that have happened in our lives or creations of our own mind, of an identity, we don't let go of. We like cling on to, like we make ourselves remember. And I think, Something about this understanding has allowed day, the dreams within day, to have that same quality as the dreams at night. Like they're not real in the way that we think. And it's not to say that life doesn't happen, but they're not real in the way that we think. And as soon as it's thought, it's immediately in the past. As soon as we've had an experience and we're aware of an experience or a feeling, it's immediately in the past. Like I can see the kindness built into our being, but then we can recall things. And I don't like why, like you often say, 
why is it that if I say something really nice to you, it seems to just like bounce off. But if I say something negative, you'll remember it forever. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, what is that? I think the, what I got from listening to everyone and then also with um, Bill's talk and Dickens talk is this idea that life's supposed to be serious. Again, it's like made up. And you see how, like I've been with people who have been at the point of, I want to give up. I don't want to be here anymore. And within five minutes of getting in a Zoom call, we're laughing about something. And I think just being able to point that out to people, like it was cool, Paul, with you yesterday, like you were so fucked up when you got the <laughs> And then we were laughing and taking the mick out of each other and, and you see how fluid it all is. Soft blood. I remember the you, you don't worry. <laughs> Good. The thorny bromance. I keep telling you, mate, I'm a jealous type. But I remember, Paul, you were saying, you know, because we, we last time we did this diagram, we put the the suicide wave up. You know, biggie for many people who come, I've had this suicide thought. I've been thinking about killing myself. And then we said, you know, and then we also had one here somewhere which said, what flavor yogurt? What flavor yogurt do I want today? What flavor yogurt do I want today? Suicide thought. Paul. Yeah, that, that is one of the most inspirational points that I've, uh, that's one of the most inspirational learnings I've had in, in, in my entire life. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I, I, I've tried killing myself last October, um, not from a prolonged period of feeling down. It was a really quick like stepping off a cliff kind of moment. And it was the only logical thing I would do. And I took the, the mental health tablets, these antidepressants that I'm on, or that I was on, I'm now off them, been off them since uh, before Christmas. Um, and I, I, took, I took these tablets and it, it, that, that was so clear. That was what I had to do that night. And the next year, when I got out of hospital, um, because strangely, the something that I just didn't believe in kind of um, came and helped that night. Um, I emailed Claire, and strangely, because she doesn't have settings on for notifications for emails, um, she woke up and checked the emails, and then rang us when I'd already taken these tablets. And um, luckily, because I started to drift off, she then rang my brother who got an ambulance out and I got taken to the hospital. And then the next year, I was so full of life the next year, not from any uh, awakening that happened to myself, nothing had, I hadn't like, um, I hadn't learned anything. But the next day I was like, I was joking with Claire and I was kind of like, being like, kind of like trying to be daft and flirty and, but then really confused when I said to Claire, I was like sitting having a coffee with her in the car. And I said like, I need to work this out. I need, because I've got a very logical brain of breaking things down. Um, and I was trying to work it all out. And Claire said, well, why did it work it out? Why did it work it out? And that, that didn't work. I would, I, would, I, would, I would hear what you were saying, but it didn't click. And then, I, luckily, I came on this retreat in November, or end of October, November time. And Dave turned around and said, well, the, the, the thought of suicide is something you acted on, but that's no different to a thought of going to a fridge and thinking about what flavour yoghurt you're going to have. And it was like, it was like a, like a double slap to me face of like, shit, that's as simple as that thought of me killing myself in October. No different. 
just I choose I chose to act on it that night. And it's it's it every time I hear it, every time I hear Dave say it, or uh, when I've listened to some of the recordings back, it just makes us smile so much as to that suicide attempt wasn't shameful, it wasn't something I should be guilty about. It was just a really simple thought that got out of hand. And I, 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 I'll, I'll always have a huge place in my heart for, for Jen and Dave um, for their help through, like, th through their teachings about this. Um, it just turned, it just turned my life around. I still have my bad days, don't get us wrong, hence the swearing with Dave and Jen yesterday lunchtime on the last retreat when I want to tell everyone to go and piss off and get off my screen. But I have more time where I'm a big smiley face and full of laughs and love and love for myself, finally, at the age of now 41. I found slightly a love for me. And that was all through these really simple um, learnings. And just as, as soon as Dave started talking about the, the, the yoga thing, I just thought I'd have to go back to that moment and share it again. It's, it's, it's so simple and so huge. I know that that comment has also created such rage in people before. So it's, in, it's interesting how it, it, like for you, it was just like that. And then people have got really mad at you for even suggesting that they could be the same, come from the same place. Yeah. Like they have diff very different consequences. They have very different feelings that. as well. But we're, we're, we're not, at this point, at this in this conversation, we're not interested in the feeling of it all. And just in this part of the conversation, we're interested in the in the fact that where the suicide thought emerges is the same place the yogurt, what flavor yogurt do I want? Thought emerges. Is the same place that the shame thought emerges. Is the same place the true, oh that's true thought emerges or the same place that the no that's false thought emerges the what the limitations that we think exist same thing what's who we find attractive our self-esteem the future it's the same place the future exists only exists within the mind the future doesn't exist anywhere on the face of the earth it only exists within the mind the same as the past same as now now the now is a state of consciousness. It's all there is. It's the same place as what? how much money is wealthy. When we start to see that, you start to collapse the dualities. You start to get closer and closer and closer to the singular, closer and closer and closer to the singular. Until all of a sudden, at some point, like Paul, it's like, shit, it is all the same thing. It's all one thing. It's all consciousness. Dreaming. This is the dream. This is the dreamer. The dreamer identifying itself as the dreams. Addiction, biggie, threat as an illness. It's a thought. Again, like Paul says, it sounds so simple. It can't be that simple. But what if it is? Addicts are always trying to fix the addiction, and I get that. 
by working on the addiction. Trying to slam the waves back in to the ocean. If an addict at some point can have a true recognition, not just a not just another wave, not just knowledge. That's all knowledge. If so, an addict can at some point realise the characteristics, the nature of addiction, like an addict isn't always, what's the word, We're, um, craving. Cravings are feelings. Feelings come from thought. They're a feeling like happiness or joy or excitement or grief. We're feeling. I remember saying to my mate, Ed, explaining that to him, and it took a little while for him to... It was only when he jumped in the van one time and he said, I jumped in the van and I saw a cigarette lighter. He said, oh, I'll have a, cig I'll have a cigarette. And he caught himself. Before I got in the van, I didn't want a cigarette. It didn't even, wasn't even crossed my mind. I didn't feel the need for a cigarette. He said, the moment I saw a lighter, I wanted a cigarette. He said, but that lighter can't create a feeling within me because it's just a piece of plastic with a flint and it's full of gas. That can't give a feeling. I created the feeling. And it was in that moment he said, I saw how the wanting of a cigarette the addiction isn't the problem isn't the cigarettes it's the it's the it's the fact that i'm associating i'm, I'm latching onto this wave this thought and that thought that wave has a consequence it creates a feeling a wave of feeling through me that i always assumed it was the cigarette creating the addiction the cigarettes are creating the addiction and also in ed's case the cocaine is creating the addiction At times it's, this doesn't look clear. At times this doesn't look clear to me. At times I get so lost in the surface of the ocean. I get so lost in the reality I'm encountering as my life, as my reality. I get so lost in it. I think it's so real. Until it changes form. And then it looks like this. And then it looks like that. And then it looks like this. Yeah, a cork's natural home is on the surface of the ocean, but a cork never gets to know the depth of the ocean. But we do. We get to find that. And when an individual finds that depth, when an individual finds that ultimate freedom, this is the ultimate freedom, the ocean can produce as many waves as it wants, but it will always be the ocean. It can create tsunamis, it will always be the ocean. It can be still as you like, it will always be the ocean. It can express itself in an infinite amount of waves. And every single time you go to the ocean, no matter how similar it looks, it's never the same. It's never the same wave pattern. Like on Grasmere right now, it's never been the wave pattern that exists on Grasmere now, that, that has ever existed before in all time, it's existed. Each moment is a totally unique expression, even if it feels like Groundhog Day. It's an expression in the moment now. You can never have the same thought twice. We're always creating fresh, even when it feels stale. Creating the experience of stale, fresh. The ocean has to have a surface. And that is the reality that we encounter in this lifetime right now. Right now. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Driven break. Oh, it's lunchtime anyway, isn't it? No. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so we break. It's because we've added in this extra hour and then we've got an extra hour later. So it's, it's confusing me. you. Yeah. Well, let's have a break and then come back and see what people yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hear from people what this kind of diagram or if there's any questions or things that occur to them through it. So if we just have a 15 minute. Yeah. 50 minutes. I might do the rainbow. Cool. Pause. Stop. Stop now. Sure. Mm -hmm. Promise. Mm -hmm. Not going to get in trouble. No, stop.